to ours. I am happy to welcome the distinguished chair of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Levin, members of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Pomeroy and Mr. Van Hollen. Gentlemen, without objection, your full statement can appear in the record and you may summarize if you choose. Mr. Levin. Thank you. It's on. The green light isn't very green. I request that the Rules Committee, this very distinguished committee, uh, provide an appropriate rule for consideration of the Senate amendment and an amendment thereto. Could you pull the microphone just a little okay. bit closer? To and an amendment thereto. So let me briefly describe uh, the amendment to the Senate amendment. Let me start with what is in the provision in the 2009 law. And our amendment would reinstitute it, but we're asking you to allow that. As you know, three and a half million exemption, 45%. The projection is that of the 2.4 million the states next year, the 99.7% would pay no estate tax. Only about 6,600 would pay a tax. And the estimate is that less than 520 or so are small businesses or family farms. We reinstitute that under our amendment because we think that the Lincoln-Kyle provision that's in the Senate version doesn't meet any of the key tests uh, for this package. Briefly, these key tests are whether they promote economic growth, whether they add to the deficit, and whether they're equitable. And in a word, the Lincoln-Kyle provision flunks on all three counts. I don't think anybody can make a case that raising it to five million, the exemption, and reducing the tax from 45 to 35 percent, the maximum tax, would promote economic growth. I don't think anybody can really argue that that would be equitable. I'm willing, and my colleagues are, to take on that argument. And in terms of adding to the deficit, clearly it does. Under Lincoln Kyle, 6,600 estates, that's all, would get an additional tax cut. The average would be over one point five million dollars. And by the way, when you look at the income distribution of the package overall, the very wealthy do very, very well indeed. Uh, the upper six tenths of, of, of one percent get 20 percent of the benefit. That, that is of the tax provisions. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, would you repeat that? It's really hard to hear what you said. The upper six tenths of one percent would get 20% of the benefit of the income provisions. And 2,800 under Lincoln Kyle would be excluded altogether, and 3,800 would receive a further cut, adding $23 billion to our national debt. So for reasons of the criteria growth, deficit and equity to Mr. Pomeroy's amendment be made in order. Thank you very much. Mr. Pomeroy, welcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Probably the last time I'll be talking to the Rules Committee uh, as a member of Congress. I want to congratulate each of you, majority and minority alike. I know you swap 
places, and you're going to be swapping places again, and either, either is hard, particularly the minority is hard, uh, but either is hard, and you're tasked with uh, keeping the place running. And in this small room, some of the hottest fights in the course of a session will take place. Uh, we all appreciate, your colleagues all appreciate your service to the institution. And as an outgoing member, I appreciate what you, you the contribution you continue to make on, on, on behalf of this great House of Representatives. Well, we appreciate your service, and we're going to miss you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to speak briefly in favor of this bill. A year ago, the House took a vote. It was a vote that passed by a vote of 225 to 200. The vote was on December 3rd, 2009, and it was to establish permanently the estate tax at 2009 levels. The levels in 2009 were the lowest estate tax levels in 80 years of estate taxation in this country. In 2009, the estate tax was at a lower level than it ever was under Ronald Reagan, low, ever lower than it ever was under George Bush I, lower than it ever was under George W. Bush. We had phased in. In fact, in 2007, the estate tax level was $2 million for an individual, $4 million for a couple, and it jumped in 2009 to $3 million, I'm sorry, $3.5 million per individual, 7 per couple, a rate of 45 percent on amounts over that. What's notable about that just isn't the historic view that this is the lowest level we've had in 80 years. Uh, it was also what we were able to achieve. At the 09 levels, 99.8 percent of the estates in this country had no estate tax. You know, it, it isn't perfection, but few things are. 99.8 percent is pretty darn close in terms of meaning the estate tax goes away for almost everybody. And there's a few over the top of that. They estimate, uh, for example, the uh, those that will receive would receive relief under Lincoln Kyle. The, levels of ta estate taxation in the Senate resolution, the Senate compromise compared to this bill, 6,600 families. Now, I think what you need to do is take a look at what we have to, what, what, what the consequences are of dealing with that final estate tax liability of the wealthiest 6,600 families in this country. Over 10 years, the difference between the Lincoln-Kyle approach and the 2009 law is $90 billion. Hmm. Now, last week, we just heard from the Deficit Commission, received a bipartisan vote of commissioners. It received bipartisan acclaim. At last, we're going to do something. Now, in the, in the Deficit Reduction Commission, they had the 09 law levels. Uh, it seems to me just really bad policies. So shortly after we receive the, 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 the report and the work of the Deficit Reduction Commission, admittedly, it didn't. It did not receive the threshold vote to come before the body, but there's some interesting ideas there in terms of tackling this deficit. It seemed to me really bad policy that we would uh, go for a higher that we would that we would take out of the revenue stream, if extended over 10 years, uh, 90 billion dollars. Again, geared at basically the wealthiest few families in this country. The 09 law, no estate tax, 99.8 percent of the families. Uh, I think this is, a, this is about the right place to leave it. The House voted that way last year. We'd appreciate an amendment to give us another shot to establish it at that level as we consider this uh, issue. I yield back. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. I want to. If you yeah. excuse me, I'm going to run down and vote in steering your policy, and I'll be back if you'll. Good luck. Can you ask I'm him? Not up. Ask him to hold the vote. Vote well. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join my, my colleagues up here in thanking every member of the Rules Committee for your, your hard work and uh, long hours, and just say a word to my friend Earl Pomeroy and thank him for his incredible uh, service uh, in the Congress. And I think that the proposal that he put forward in the Congress uh, not that long ago uh, to keep the estate tax at the highest level of exemptions and the lowest rates uh, under the Bush uh, plan until, of course, this year was an eminently sensible compromise. Uh, as he pointed out, uh, it was the highest exemption and lowest rate in decades and decades. Uh, we just heard from the Bipartisan Deficit Commission in the document entitled A Moment of Truth. 
about how we got to get serious on deficit reduction. And so the question that this amendment boils down to is, is, is this. Do we really think at this time of high deficits it makes sense to give a $23 billion tax benefit to 6,600 families a year for two years? Is that really what we want to be doing at this particular moment in history? It doesn't create jobs. It adds to the deficits. And you're providing, at a time when many families are struggling, what I think most people would consider a really unfair bonanza and giveaway that amounts to about, on average, $1.7 million break for each of those 6,600 families a year. Is that really the message this Congress wants to send to the country at a time of high deficit? So I, I, I thank uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Pomeroy. I thank the committee and uh, ask that you uh, make this amendment in order. Well, thank you, and I thank you all for being here. And, um, uh, you know, I have, um, just speaking for myself, um, I, have, I, I look at this package that has just been voted on in the Senate that's coming before us, and I kind of scratch my head and wonder, did anybody at all listen to the Deficit Commission? Uh, did anybody, is, is anybody really serious about reducing, reducing our deficit? You know, we have these great battles um, in Congress over whether or not we should extend unemployment benefits to those who are unemployed. And, we, and my friends on the Republican side insist that it has to be paid for. Yet when it comes to tax cuts for wealthy people, you don't have to pay for them. And uh, we do know uh, that this estate tax is not only incredibly generous, it is, as you pointed out, the most generous estate tax deal that, uh, that has ever been in place. Uh, with the exception of the of the of the total exemption, um, and if you're serious about reducing the deficit, we all have to play a role. You know, the president announced a few weeks ago that he wants to freeze the wages of all federal employees. There was no cutoff uh, in terms of income, uh, so you have some federal employees who, quite frankly, earn pretty low salaries. You're going to freeze their salaries in order to reduce the deficit and at the same time pass an estate tax to benefit 6,200 families, 600, yeah. you know, at, you know that at a cost of $23 billion, just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so while I have a lot of problems with the entire package, I think what you're proposing here uh, is very reasonable. Um, and I think most Americans would think it's reasonable uh, as well. And um, you know, I hope that we can, we, we can act on it. But having said that, let me... Mr. You know, Chairman, yeah. members of the committee, I, too, have to join um, my colleague in the Steering and Policy right. Committee. So you're going to leave Mr. Pomeroy here he, all alone to be the author uh, to yeah. the <laughs> Rules yeah. Committee. I've got really. nothing to do, yeah. nowhere to go. <laughs> <knows it all>. <laughs> <laughs> so Levin has fallen, Van Hollen has now fallen, and uh, Pomeroy is still standing, or at least sitting before the Rules Committee. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me... Uh, let me echo the statements of uh, Messrs. Levin and Van Hollen and say that, uh, that um, Earl Pomeroy is without a doubt one of the most thoughtful members of this institution. And while I'm very pleased over the fact that his departure is going to play a role in my moving one chair to the left, as he and I have discussed before, um, if I went through a list of people I would like to have uh, played a role in allowing me the chance to chair this committee. Uh, suffice it to say that Earl Pomeroy would not have been at the top of, of my uh, list. And I uh, have appreciated working with him on a wide range of issues over the years. And uh, I know that one of the things that uh, is important is for us to try and, uh, while we often have disagreements, to work in a civil matter and, at the end of the day, come to uh, some kind of agreement. And Earl Pomeroy has been someone with whom we can do that on a, on a regular basis. I will say that um, I, I, for one, uh, believe that the, the tax rate on a state should be exactly where it is at this moment. And uh, this was the, the goal that we had at the very beginning. Without going through the litany of arguments uh, on uh, the uh, estate tax itself, I, I will say that the, the, constant, the constant drumbeat that the only way to raise revenues, or one of the few ways to raise revenues, is to see an increase on this uh, intergenerational uh, burden that is passed on, is, from my perspective, a specious one. I happen to believe that uh, we're in a position of, um, uh, of actually playing a role in enhancing 
the flow of revenues to the Federal Treasury if we were to keep the tax rate uh, at it is, as it is at this moment. Why? Because uh, as we focus on something that Democrats and Republicans alike uh, regularly talk about, and I believe sincerely want to have happen, that is job creation and economic growth that will play a role in, uh, in diminishing the uh, huge deficit and debt burden that is being passed on to future generations. Uh, I believe that keeping this tax at the rate that it is will play a role in uh, job creation. So gentleman, Having know, said, of course I'm happy. Does the gentleman really believe that being able to inherit $10 million tax-free is a burden? Um, I mean, that's... No, that, I, don't, that, I, don't, that, I don't believe, I don't believe that, that inheriting $10 I mean, million, that's, that's, I don't believe that's inheriting this, $10 million that's is a burden. I, I'm not Kyle, saying... Uh, I, I don't believe it's a burden. I happen to believe, I happen to believe that what we need to do is, is we need to focus on job creation and economic growth so that we can decrease the annual deficits that we see in the future and the debt burden that is being passed on to future generations. And I argue that keeping the rate as it is will play a very, very, have a very salutary effect in our goal of reducing that. Now, I know that we have a disagreement on this, but that happens to be uh, my perspective, and I think that there's a wide range of empirical evidence out there that will that will verify that. I will say that we know what's going to happen here now. It appears that that Mr. Pomeroy's amendment is going to be made in order, and I'm I'm fine with that. Uh, I I think that uh, if we look at what the president has done, um, seeking uh, a resolution to a very challenging issue, which I wish had been dealt with a long time ago, before this last minute uh, deal was put together. Um, I, I think that, that uh, the potential for unraveling it, as Leader McConnell uh, has said, is uh, before us. I hope that that doesn't happen. I don't like this bill, but I like even less the notion of increasing taxes on working Americans. And that is exactly what is going to happen if this measure does fall apart and, uh, and doesn't pass. Now, if we're going to make Mr. Pomeroy's amendment in order, I know we have uh, a number of other proposals that have been put forward. Mr. Graves, the gentleman from Georgia, is here looking forward to testifying. Mr. Herger is here as well. And uh, we have other uh, proposals that uh, have been submitted to us that I hope we'll have uh, a chance to, uh, to uh, consider. And, um, and if we are going to be uh, making these in order, the proposals that, uh, like Mr. Pomeroy's in order, I hope that we'll have a chance to, to deal with these other issues as well. I think that it is very, very important for us as members of Congress to ensure that we don't do anything to undermine this very fragile economic recovery that seems to have begun. And I believe that increasing taxes on any Americans at this juncture has the great potential to diminish something that we all want to see take place, and that is strong, robust, job-creating economic recovery. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I just want to point out for the record that um, we have voted, I think, at least twice in this House to extend uh, tax benefits to middle-class working families. Uh, unfortunately, we have to deal with the United States Senate, where you need 60 votes to order a pizza. Uh, and so it's, it's 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 a very difficult uh, body to to de deal there. with, right? Right. But uh, but I but I you know so uh, the issue here is whether or not the wealthiest Americans uh, need to play any role in helping us reduce this this deficit. Certainly, middle income families are bearing the burden, and they didn't cause it. Uh, so this is about fairness. Um, I'd like to yield. Mr. To Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, this this is a comment that has nothing to do with anything, but I just want. You to know and want members of the committee to know one of the very first calls I got on November 3rd was from David Dreyer. It meant a lot to me, and I appreciate it very much, David. Could, could I say a word? It turned out the vote hadn't started, but now it has. Okay. And so, <laughs> Mr. Well, because I love this committee so much, I, I just wanted another few minutes to, you know, to talk about increasing taxes. What we're doing is is essentially, we're, we're essentially replacing what is now with 09. And what you're saying is that- You guys didn't think that Tom Roy was still alive. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> and what you're saying is that to take uh, Lincoln Kyle instead of 09, 
is something relating to working families in this country, 6,600 families of immense wealth. And I think that, if I might say so, misuses the term working families. And therefore, I'll quote somebody who I don't think exactly would say he's part of mainstream working families in this country, Mr. Buffett. I quote, in a country that prides itself on equality of opportunity, it is becoming anything but that is the gap between the super rich and the middle class widens in dramatic fashion. And what Lincoln Kyle does is to increase that, that width even more so without any evidence it relates to growth. And for those who are worried, all of us are, about deficits, 23 billion for 6,600 families for a tiny, tiny fraction of the American public. So with that, you voted. I'm now going to Mr. Take, go back and thank vote. you. Thank you for hearing me. Mr. Hastings. The gentleman that remain can answer my question. What happens to people, the working poor, between 10,000, say a person makes $10,000 a year up to 40,000? They get an extension or do they get a tax increase? You mean under the bill? All, under the Senate bill. Yeah, I'm not talking about Earl's yeah. estate thing. I'm uh, under the Senate bill. Uh, under, the, under the bill, I mean, we're, as I understand it, uh, if you are, first of all, you would have a 2% payroll uh, deduction. Uh, that would be the primary tax benefit uh, under that bill, in addition, of course, uh, to the fact that if the bill is not enacted by after January 1, you will have a, a middle-class tax uh, increase going into effect as well. Well, I uh, share um, and wish to associate myself with the marks, uh, remarks of Mr. Dreyer and Mr. McGovern with reference to my colleague and classmate. Earl uh, Pomeroy, uh, uh, we came here uh, at the same time, and I'm not certain that I'm uh, wise to stay beyond the period of time that he's leaving. <laughs> um, but at the same time, we thank you for your service and thank you for your kind comments regarding thank, all of thank us. You. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to make sure that members all have an opportunity to get a seat. So if uh, I don't think everybody has a seat right now, so I think we may be all set. But uh, Dr. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to um, comment or, and ask Mr. Van Hollen to further comment on something that he said. I wrote down that you said, we are giving, and then I was writing it down, and, and I didn't get the rest of your sentence. But it, it seems to me that the attitude um, of you and many of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle is that all the money that people earn is, belongs to the government, and that if they're allowed to keep some of that money, then it is the government giving back money to them. We constantly hear that phrase, we are giving them something. So is it, is it your attitude that all the money people earn belongs to the government and whatever they're allowed to keep is a gift from the government? Uh, no, my attitude is this, uh, that the Government of the United States has to support some very essential and important functions, uh, like the national defense, like our veterans, uh, like the education uh, programs that we support, like research at NIH, uh, like, in fact, paying the salaries of members of Congress, which many Americans might not think is one of the higher priorities, uh, but it's part of the functioning of government. And then the question is, how do you, how do you pay for it? And you pay for it in a fair and equitable way. I don't think I, I'd be surprised if someone was to propose that we just eliminate all revenue for government. Maybe that is your position. But if you agree that it's important to support certain national government functions, then the question becomes, what's the best way to do it? And in my view, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, was right, uh, a great Republican president uh, who believed that uh, <laughs> when it came to the estate tax, those people who had accumulated great wealth, uh, when they died, uh, there would be some form of estate tax, that you don't have a permanent American aristocracy. That was his theory behind it. Uh, 
we have different ways of raising revenue, income tax, sales tax. This is, all, this is for, as, as Mr. Pomeroy pointed out, for decades and decades, been part of that mix. In fact, in 2009, the estate tax burden was the lowest level in decades. So what we're simply proposing here is that it continue to be at the 2009 levels, which was the lowest level for years and years and years, and simply ask the question, uh, when you're thinking of different forms of raising revenue, income taxes and sales taxes and other taxes, which I hope we'd agree you do have to raise if you're going to carry on the functions of government, including our national defense, what's the best and fairest way to do it? And we don't think at this point in time when we have a deficit problem, we should be spending 20, we should be using $23 billion for the benefit of, of 6,600 families that we think we all need to pay our fair share, and, uh, and that's, that's part of uh, what it means to uh, support, as I say, the essential functions of our democracy. Well, I find it interesting that all of you have become so concerned about the deficit and $23 billion when um, I suspect that you, I'm not sure about Mr. Pomeroy, uh, voted for the stimulus package, which added a trillion dollars to our deficit. You voted for the health care bill, which is going to wind up, if it stays in place, adding several trillion dollars to the deficit. But all of a sudden, you're so concerned over $23 billion when you voted in the last two years for trillions of dollars worth of deficit and debt. Actually, I, I'm happy to, respond, happy to respond to that. I didn't ask for a response. Well, OK. So, it, it, uh, I, think, I think you should get I, I, up, I think, up, well, you, 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 you asked how I voted and, so, or, and made some guesses. Yeah. So if I. Always go through the chair, except in this committee, it's much looser. We don't we don't talk directly to a person about their particular motives or actions. We go through the chair, and I would ask that we we follow that. And I respect my friend from North Carolina, but to you can talk generally about what has been done, but to go through you know to continually continually refer to these individuals, I think is is uh, out of order. I thank, thank my colleague, but I would appreciate the opportunity now to respond since the reference was made uh, to my voting record. And, you know, the Congressional Budget Office is, is the arbiter, it's the neutral arbiter in this uh, body of whether something adds to the deficit or does not. Uh, there are many things you can say about the uh, health care bill. Uh, I happen to think it was a very good piece of legislation. Uh, but one thing you cannot say is that CBO said it would add to the deficit. In fact, CBO score. Uh, indicates that it would a add a trillion dollars to the um, uh, to our our bottom line and not be uh, added added to the deficit. So that's just a, a flat wrong uh, statement. With respect with respect to the uh, recovery bill, the stimulus bill uh, called by many, uh, I think we would all agree that the priority had to be uh, to get our country out of economic freefall and stabilize uh, the economy uh, and. That was a priority. Uh, and in fact, the most important thing to do in terms of long-term deficits was to get the economy uh, back in, in gear. Uh, so uh, we have these priorities of both getting the economy in gear right away, but also recognizing we have to put this country on a sustainable long-term fiscal footing. And I think it sends a terrible signal about whether we're serious about that or not when you provide this kind of huge uh, tax break uh, to the biggest estates in the country, especially, as my colleague said, uh, less than two weeks after the moment of truth report from the Bipartisan uh, Deficit Reduction Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would just say that um, talking about adding to the debt the $23 billion, because um, uh, that money has not been coming in to the Treasury, uh, without doing this bill and getting the money, you're counting on getting something that we weren't going to get anyway. Um, there's just two very different opinions about uh, what the government, spending by the federal government does for the economy. Uh, and I think that we don't have to really make a big case 
for the fact that the spending doesn't make a difference or, or it makes it worse because we have the history from the last two years of what has happened. The trillion dollars was spent with the stimulus. We were promised that unemployment rates would not go above 8%. They've stayed at almost 10 percent since that very same time, since that time. And so we know that it has been a failure. Uh, and I don't think we really have to argue that because the statistics already show us that. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any other Did comments I, or questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Palmer, wanted to. Mr. Chairman, well, now, now I have to leave, oh, okay. and, and the, uh, I just uh, basically leave three data points. In 2009, we had the lowest estate tax that we'd had, lowest rate of taxation on estates that we had in 80 years. Uh, it meant 99.8 percent of the estates didn't have any tax whatsoever of, of an estate tax. Uh, we also have the highest debt that this country has ever struggled with. And so it would seem to me that to take the estate tax uh, e down even lower than 2009, adding to the debt an additional $23 billion over two, but we're more worried about that thing just being continued at that rate, which be $90 billion lost over 10 for the wealthiest few families in this country. It, it makes no sense. We're going to start dealing with deficits. Let's start right now, and that's why I asked the amendment be put in order. Thank Mr. you very Chairman, much. Mr. Yeah, Chairman, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes. I, I have to make one other little correction. Mr. Pomeroy very carefully ends talking about having the lowest rate in 2009 and just ignores 2010 when we have a zero <laughs> inheritance de or death tax. And so I find it kind of interesting you do that. It's the same thing with Mr. Van Hollen, who so cleverly stops talking about what the CBO does for 10 years. And we know <laughs> the way the bills are drawn up it's to get the number that you want. And we know that the CBO says that the health care bill will raise the deficit after 10 years, Mr. Van Hollen. So again, you can play with the numbers and you can play with the years. But Mr. Pomeroy, please, we had the lowest rate for 80 years in 2009. But in 2010, it was even lower. And I find it interesting that you would just ignore that. But, uh, just to brief, briefly in response, uh, you know, I, I think that is generally acknowledged that uh, no estate tax in the revenue mix of this country is bad policy. And, and that's why basically the argument is on what level uh, that estate tax should be. We suggest that the 09 level is the correct right. one. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congresswoman Fox, I really urge you to read the CBO reports. The CBO reports not only show that the health care reduces the deficit over the first 10 years, but it reduces it by even more over the second 10 years. Take a look at the CBO report. You mentioned how Mr. Pomeroy had not talked about the 2010 year with respect to estate taxes. Uh, I would remind you that when this Congress uh, passed the law, when, when President Bush was president, that they sunset that in 2010, so that beginning January 1 of this year under current law, if no change is made, the estate tax goes to an exemption of $1 million with a rate of 55% over uh, any amount over that. And so actually, under the CBO scoring, the, the change in law proposed in this bill is six, in, the, in the Senate bill compared to current law is $68 billion over two years. By presenting this compromise, what we're simply saying is, for God's sakes, let's at least go back to the 2009 levels uh, and, and, and not go to this extra $23 billion uh, for 6,600 families a year. But I, I would remind you that the way that law was written uh, when, the, when, when your party was in control of Congress, beginning January 1, the exemption goes to one million, and the rate above it is 55 percent. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much, and I thank you very much, Mr. Van Hollen and uh, Mr. Palmer. I want to hear Mr. Levin also. I know this has been um, difficult working through this. And um, I'd just like to say that um, there is much here to like and much here not to like. Um, the fact is, is that um, we're dealing now with the state tax, which 
going back to where it was in the Bush era, was very generous and I believe very fair. And we voted for this in, in Congress at this level. And to find out now that we even want to have a, a lower rate um, with a higher, um, in a sense, uh, level is, to me, is, is like a bridge too far. And I think that what we're dealing with here is not anything about wealthy versus not so wealthy. We're, we're dealing here with our country and what we'd like to see going to the future. And quite frankly, I think everybody has to admit that this does is something that we don't need to do and will add to the deficit. And as you said, we had the Fiscal Commission a couple of weeks ago where the whole nation is focused on a deficit. And we realize moving forward that there are elements of this package anyway that will add to the deficit we're hoping for as the economy will come back. And I feel, and I think most of the people on this side of the aisle feel that it's unnecessary to go to this level. It's to most of us a bridge too far. It is not necessary. What Mr. Pomeroy's amendment, which we voted for before and passed, sets it at a level which is very, very generous and is something that I believe that most of us here can agree to. And um, my feeling is, is that it is actually um, the, the part, the situation where the, the House must, in essence, look at this. Um, it was presented to us, and we're dealing with it, the many elements of this. The estate tax just came at us, and we knew that this was something we needed to deal with. So I do appreciate what you've done and what the Ways and Means Committee has done to come to, a, I think, a fair um, and equitable solution to this as we move forward. So I do appreciate this very much. Thank you. And before I go to Mr. Curie, let me just re tell the members that are here that there's one vote. So you might want to go vote and come back. Um, we're going to keep this thing going. Mr. Akuri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen, thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I, I'd just like to say I, I think that this institution is truly at its best when uh, both sides, both parties work together to try to come to solutions to problems. I think we are the least effective when we point fingers and talk about the kind of political things that I heard uh, my friend uh, Ms. Fox just talking about. I think that is the counterproductive uh, thing that America is tired of, and I think that we really need to, to really focus on solutions and ideas rather than pointing fingers at who's at fault for what. Having said that, you know, I, I look at the, 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 the tax bill, and my sense is, with respect to um, uh, extending the, the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, I'm supportive of that. Not because the wealthiest Americans can't afford to pay more tax, I think they can afford but because I think that it would be critical to helping us with respect to turning the economy around. Now, I listen to the arguments about the estate tax, and I don't understand how reducing the amount of estate tax will in any way, shape, fashion, or form help the economy. And I think that's what we're looking at. So to require additional estate tax, which isn't exorbitant, but the 2009 levels would do things like help to fund our defense, help to fund our infrastructure, our water systems, things that are absolutely critical for government. That's what it's all about. All we heard about in this past election was uh, the, the, the deficit. The deficit, well, this certainly will help to reduce this deficit. And the last point that I want to make, and, and it goes to something, Mr. Van Hollen, that you said earlier. You know, we were here last week, and I think uh, my friend uh, uh, Ms. Fox talked about while we were debating the DREAM Act, America being the great meritocracy, and the fact that in America, you were able to achieve, you were able to succeed because of your merit, because of your ability. And I would submit that that's what Mr. Van Hollen was talking about when he talked about the estate tax and, and the idea when they first enacted it of preventing the development of an aristocracy in America and making sure that America continues to be the great meritocracy that it is, that the people who can achieve the most do achieve the most, and you get ahead, not because of who your parents are, or not because of how much money your parents had, but rather because of your own ability. 
That's what I think this debate focuses on today, and that's why I think that Mr. Pomeroy is correct in uh, his amendment. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, and uh, I appreciate the comments of uh, my friend from New York, Mr. R. Curry. And um, I, I uh, applaud the gentleman for bringing this amendment. I voted for this amendment uh, a year ago. I'm going to support this amendment. We, uh, it's, it's generous in certain respects uh, already, uh, but it, uh, as it is uh, set forth compared to what's in the bill, it saves the country some $23 billion, or allows us to pay bills in the amount of $23 billion. At the end of the day, this is about our nation paying its bills for services uh, that are rendered to it. And uh, I couldn't have said it any better than uh, Mr. R. Curry, uh, that this is a place where we can uh, make sure that folks who have worked hard and have uh, developed estates up to $3.5 million for an individual, $7 million for a couple, uh, can pass that estate on to their family. Over that, then there is uh, payment uh, of taxes for that, and it represents some 99.8 percent of American families as the amendment is drafted. And uh, I thank the gentleman for bringing it, and I will support this amendment. Thank you very much, all. Ms. Pingree, Mr. Van Holland says he has to go, so you don't have anybody to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Holland. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brady? Mr. Brady will probably come back a little bit later. Mr. Herger? Yep. Wondering about Ms. Fox and voting. Is David coming back? Yeah. All right. Yes, sir, Mr. Herger. You have the floor. Mr. Chairman and members, I'm offering this amendment because it's time for Congress to stop demanding port barrel projects as the price for moving forward on the American people's priorities. There are many provisions I support in this tax agreement. It is absolutely imperative that Congress act to prevent the job-killing tax increase that's are set to take effect on January 1, at a time when our economy is struggling to recover, it's hard to imagine a worse idea than giving the green light to the largest tax increase in American history. It's especially vital that we stop the looming tax hikes on capital gains and dividends, which threaten to put a freeze on investment. The estate tax relief in this agreement is also critically important for family farmers and business owners in Northern California and across the country. However, I also have some serious concerns with this legislation, the failure to pay for the extension of unemployment benefits will only add to the burden of debt we are passing along to future generations, and the inclusion of special interest giveaways is a slap in the face to the American people who have made it clear that it's time to end business as usual in Washington. My amendment strikes from the bill the extension of taxpayer subsidies for ethanol. These subsidies are among the worst examples of waste, inefficiency, and special interest politics in the federal government. According to the Joint Committee on Taxation, Extending the ethanol tax credit for an additional year will increase the federal deficit by nearly $5 billion. As if that weren't enough, Congress also protects the industry from competition and raises costs for consumers by imposing a steep tariff on less expensive foreign-produced ethanol. This raises the question, what exactly are the taxpayers getting for this $5 billion in ethanol subsidies. We already have regulations that mandate production of nearly 13 billion gallons of ethanol and other renewable fuels this year, a requirement that is set to increase in the future. One study found that as a result of this mandate, the corn ethanol industry would continue to grow even if the tax credit expired. At the same time, the ethanol tax credit 
distorts the economy by diverting corn from feedstock to energy production, raising costs for farmers and ranchers. Furthermore, recent evidence has thoroughly refuted the alleged environmental benefits of replacing fossil fuels with corn-based ethanol. All of this points to one simple conclusion. The ethanol tax credit and the ethanol tariff are the poster children for government waste. This is an industry that is getting special treatment solely because it happens to have good political connections. The American people are tired of Congress hiding special interest pork in must-pass bills. It's time to do away with these subsidies once and for all. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Any questions, Mr. Dreyer? I just want to express my appreciation to Mr. Herger for his very thoughtful comments and his diligent work in his effort to uh, keep this burden low. He mentioned Northern California, but uh, I hope that you'd include all of California. He did say the rest of the nation, too, but I, I will hope that all of California will be considered in your uh, priorities there. And um, I hope very much that we'll have an opportunity to consider your proposal. Any other questions? Thank you very much for being here. Thank Appreciate you very it. much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brady. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the House Ways and Means Committee, Ranking Member Dave Camp, in support of this tax relief measure uh, in opposition to uh, Congressman Pomeroy's amendment to increase the death taxes on family-owned farms and businesses. And I'm here as an individual to offer a, an amendment to cut $150 billion of spending uh, in the federal government to, to cover the costs uh, of this bill. From the Ways and Means perspective, we think, uh, we think this is critical to the economy and critical to taxpayers. Increasing uh, taxes by almost $4 trillion on American families when they can't afford it and they're struggling, small businesses when they're trying to add jobs, on capital gains and dividends, which our seniors live on uh, to, uh, to make ends meet, to allow the alternative minimum tax to hit 25 million middle-class families, and to bring the death tax back to where we have family farms and, and, and small businesses that have worked their whole life to build a nest egg, and to have Uncle Sam swoop in and take more than half of everything they've earned is wrong, is morally wrong, and, uh, and I uh, oppose that. The extension of uh, R&D tax credit critical to jobs as well as the state and local sales tax deduction. This bill has strong support to, from many conservatives such as Americans for Tax Reform, Freedom Works, National Taxpayers Union, and other leaders um, within the conservative movement. There is a real concern about both the uh, Pomeroy Amendment uh, and the spending in this bill. Uh, the Pomeroy Amendment uh, uh, brings back the death tax almost in full uh, life. It would impose the second highest death tax rate uh, among um, uh, OECD countries, our competitors in the world, and confiscates the hard-earned uh, work of our family farms and businesses. That amendment is opposed by the Family Business Estate uh, Planning uh, Coalition, 42 organizations that include your neighbor family farms, your neighborhood grocery stores, newspapers, uh, auto dealers, uh, beer wholesalers, your local uh, builders, in contractors as well as the independent businesses, and I uh, urge uh, its defeat. Final point, uh, like other conservatives, uh, I believe this bill should be paid for. We have several of our leading conservatives here today, Congressman Jim Jordan and Tom Price among them, offering uh, an amendment as well to cover the uh, spending of this bill. My amendment uh, is modeled on the uh, Coburn Amendment offered in the Senate today. Uh, it takes the recommendations of the Bipartisan Deficit Commission and puts them into place and includes a Sunset Commission to eliminate wasteful spending. Part, some of these cuts include a 15% uh, immediate cut in the White House and congressional budget, freezes pay raise for members of Congress for three years, for federal workers as well, reduces the federal workforce by 10%, requires the sale of excess federal property, eliminates uh, duplication in programs, and ends funding for corporation of public broadcasting, among other common sense cuts that the Deficit Commission brought forward. Uh, it's critical that we pay for this bill. My view is that, uh, and my hope is that uh, you will allow an up-down vote on this uh, spending reduction 
so this bill can be completely paid for. Thank Madam you, Mr. Chairman. Brady. Are there any questions for Mr. Brady? I, I just have a, a couple of questions. Oh, yes, sir. Um, when you were talking about the estate tax, you were just saying that I, you made this comment about Uncle Sam taking half of what everybody, uh, what everybody has. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just confused. I mean, under the, under the bill that's before us, uh, a couple could receive ten million dollars tax free, and then there's a uh, there's a tax beyond that. I mean, I, we, we're told that there's sixty two hundred people in this country that are affected at all. 6,600 60, 60, 60, are affected all by by this. I, I just, I, mean, I, 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 I'm just, you know, maybe it's just political rhetoric, but I'm just trying to put this in perspective. I don't know a lot of people, you know, who, um, you know, who get ten million dollars tax free, uh, and uh, I don't know a lot of people who have those kinds of estates. But the fact of the matter is, uh, that's a that's a the, the what is in this bill right now. I think is overly generous given what's going on. You talked about uh, you're going to uh, implement the recommendations in the bipartisan commission that uh, do, you, do you include eliminating the tax deduction um, for uh, on the interest for on the uh, for people who own homes you we eliminate that too so people can't deduct the interest on their taxes is that no these are spending cuts oh, in the size okay. of government and you talk about freezing federal the, the work of uh, the pay rate pay of federal employees do you have a cutoff I mean uh, does the person who's you know who's cleaning our clean the floors of federal buildings who may make twenty thousand dollars a year do their do their uh, salaries get frozen uh, uh, yeah just as much as somebody who's making over a hundred thousand dollars a year I mean everybody who's a federal worker their salary gets frozen it does uh, as the yeah. president's recommended right no and I, I just I think this uh, sure. kind of this inherent sense of unfairness in that I mean um, you know there are people who you know, whose salaries you want to freeze, who earn far less than you do, far less than I do. Uh, and, um, you know, and at the same time, you know, we're enacting, uh, we're extending generous tax cuts to the wealthiest individuals in this country, and we have an estate tax here that is the most generous in the history of our country, with the exception of the fact that it, it expired. Um, it just, I mean, wh where's the balance? Or where's the fairness? Why, why do low-income people and middle-income families have to bear the burden of digging our country out of this mess that they did not create. And then we're all rushing to give the richest people in this country the most generous tax breaks possible. I think we got our priorities all messed up here. I mean, we need to focus on middle-income families. We've, we've passed already in this Congress twice a tax cut for middle-income families. Um, and, uh, you know, and yet you're, you're coming up here proposing that you're going to offset the, the benefits for the wealthiest people by doing things that are going to negatively impact not only middle-income families, but low-income families. I mean, there's got to be some fairness here uh, in terms of getting ourselves out of this, uh, out of this deficit. And, and I don't see that in your proposal. And, I, and again, I, mean, I want people to understand that the estate tax <coughs> relief that in this bill right now, if you, it's $10 million tax-free for a couple, ten million dollars. That's an awful lot of money. May I answer? Yeah, sure. One, thank you for those points, and thank you all for your uh, role of uh, serving on the important rules committee. Two thoughts: one, uh, this was a bipartisan deficit commission, uh, uh, many of uh, whose uh, provisions were endorsed by the White House uh, and by Democrats as well as some Republicans. We do need to get serious about uh, uh, trimming this government back. Uh, reducing what is now the third highest deficit uh, on the globe. I think uh, these, uh, these uh, provisions are a good start, and $150 billion will pay for But why do you ignore the Deficit Commission's and if recommendation? I, if I may, why, why do you ignore the Mr. Deficit McGovern. Commission's recommendation that we basically enact an estate tax policy like the one Mr. Pomeroy has? Well, let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, why do you pick and choose? Well, the reason that we are opposing Mr. Pomeroy's uh, amendment is that uh, come January 1st, uh, taxes uh, on family-owned farms and businesses will go to 55 percent. Uh, that's more than half of everything they've earned. So the government has a greater claim of everything they've spent a lifetime to earn than the person themselves. That's not the that, Pomeroy that is, proposal. That is what the law will do if this bill doesn't pass. And my belief is uh, uh, it's immoral. For the government, that's not their money. Well, that's not what we're talking we had, about. Well, actually, it is. No, because we're talking about Mr. whether Pomeroy's bill raises the tax as opposed to the $10 million tax-free. 
No, not Mr. Pomeroy. Yeah, Mr. Pomeroy. Uh, no, the, the, the current, the current That's thing. That's right. Mr. Pomeroy said it was $7 yeah. million. Dollars. And I think $7 million dollars tax about free. about much of this. $7 million but tax But here's free. the point. I had a, I had a family-owned nursery come to me. Uh, three of the four kids work in the nursery. Our families uh, work their whole life building it up. And they showed me, they just went through the numbers, where their family has no debt, has built a successful family-owned business from scratch, under the death tax that they will face, uh, if the kids can take out enough insurance on their family, and if they go to the bank and go back in debt, they may be able to keep their own family-owned business. I, Think about what they're saying. I, I if they could, the debt ten, tax ten million dollars or seven million dollars. Well, no, 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 well actually, it is because no. that's current law, Mr. McGovern. Well, but you know, and, and you can have this conversation with my family-owned business right, all not, you want. We're not talking, but the point but being, what, what's that the, if I may finish, yeah, let, let, if I may finish, as I did you, why should any family have to take out large amounts of life insurance on their parents and go back into debt simply to keep their own family-owned business? What has the government done to deserve their business, their farm, their nest egg. Now we're, I we're, believe we're, nothing. Well, I think that now, now we're getting now we now we're giving it zero. Okay, in well that's, that's fine. You we're believe it should be zero. To push for zero but that, in but, America. But we're not talking about a fifty-five percent tax. But we're not. But we're not. We're not, a, we're not talking about a fifty-five. We're not talking about a fifty-five percent. We're talking about sixty-six hundred people in this country that would be impacted. Uh, you know, uh, by the text. I yield to the I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I yeah. was called away, Mr. Brady, but what, what I want to understand is this family that you're speaking of, as a small nursery? No, it is, it is, um, it has grown larger over the years, thanks to their hard work. It's worth $10 million. Yeah, I don't know that. I didn't, uh, well, well then they're the not going to be taxed. Well, I said I don't know, so did well, you want to give know, them a this call? Is, this is always where I get lost in this conversation. That they all said all the family farmers and all the small groceries and everybody are going to go under, but they're not in the bracket that pays this tax anyway. So, so it's 98%, yeah. I think, of all Americans are not even. Well, can I ask you this? Do yes. you support the death tax going back to 1,055%? Uh, um, that's a heck of a lot uh, lower than it was 15, 20 years ago. But you uh, do. I, just, the, I support keeping the government running. I think okay. we all should pay our fair share. So I the government that. taking more than my half of everything they earn. My father brought me up for that. My father was Above actually a man who was, well, was anxious to yeah. pay taxes. Yeah. He always we said just, it's because I'm doing yeah. well and I owe something back to this government. We honestly do we see got, things so differently about we, 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 the we opportunity what, and the well, hard if, work of families. Whose money that is. I, Obviously, you believe it's the government. No. Well, if this is a family group business but, that makes more than ten million dollars a year, I think they should pay taxes. Just, let me be honest. Yeah. So, if they taxes. worked hard, become successful. Certainly. No matter what, whether it's one million as you support. No. Right. No, you know, I'm saying 10. they ten million. No. The issue, Mr. Mr. Brady, so you know, the, the, the issue, the issue before us is whether or not you're going to hard support too hard. The, the, issue, no. the, the government owes you money. Excuse me. The reporter cannot sure. both yeah. of you. Right. The the the, the issue right now is that in the current bill is a $10, $10 million tax-free. Mr. Pomeroy is talking about $7 million tax-free. That's what we're talking about. So all the other stuff that you're talking about is not even real. So that, that's, what, that's what's at the, the issue here. And what we're simply saying, you know, as the deficit, Bipartisan Deficit Commission said, you know, that what the, the proposal that Mr. Pomeroy has is the, is, is the better way to go if you're serious about deficit reduction. So that's what this debate is about. It's not about eliminating, you know, it's not, it's not about imposing a 55% tax cut on, on all the states. Well, in fact, you know, and so that's just, a, that's just a bogus argument. What we're talking about is whether or not we're going to keep the current language that is in the bill that the Senate passed or whether or not uh, a better way to proceed and a more responsible way to proceed is as Mr. Pomeroy pointed out. Which would which would contribute greatly to deficit reduction. That's what the issue is, not what you're talking about. Can I make I a point on time. deficit reduction? We, Ma Madam, Madam, Chairman, yeah, Madam Chairman, I'd like to ask you a question. <coughs> uh, in your comments a little bit ago to Mr. Brady, you said you think <coughs> that if it's worth ten million dollars, they should pay taxes. Yes. Are you under the assumption that they haven't already paid taxes? <coughs> I mean, I, we have a nursery mm -hmm. business, and um, we we pay taxes on everything that we earn. 
Uh, isn't do we, you we're not understand? About, we're talking about this estate tax. I know, but Mark, but is your is your business worth more than ten million? No, it's not. But well, then you're not involved in this estate tax issue. Well, what I'm asking you is, it, do you assume they have not paid taxes? Of course not. Well, that's the comment. There that are you various made. kinds of taxes. We're talking about the estate tax. Right. But if they've already when I came in and we were talking about the estate tax. But if they have which only sixty six hundred people in the United States will be required to pay under this plan as it is now. But Madam Chairman, the implication from you was you said they should pay taxes. Well, well they've I, already paid my guess is they've paid taxes on their earnings. They've paid I taxes sure on capital gains. I hope so. This would probably be the third tax that they would be paying on the same wealth. I think that's a little extreme to ask the government to take from people money three times, taxes three times on the same earnings. But I, I think it's real important that we explain that people have already paid those, have already paid taxes. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the state tax. I see that you're not. So do you yield back? I'm, I, well, yeah, I'm paying, I'm talking about the estate tax too, All but right. I just want to make it clear that these people have already paid taxes. They've paid some taxes, absolutely. Okay, but thank property you. Property tax, school tax, who knows what. Uh, Mr. Hastings. Madam Chair, there's been a, a, a growing number of persons who say that rich people very, very wealthy people, the landed gentry, um, and the 6,600 individuals, many of whom are entrepreneurial and indeed uh, uh, did earn um, a substantial amount of money uh, through efforts of their own. Some larger portion of them are the uh, persons who inherited their money, and they didn't, many of them didn't work a single day in their life anywhere. Uh, that doesn't mean that they aren't entitled um, uh, to their money, but what we have is a system um, uh, where there is fairness and unfairness, uh, and anyone that has to pay taxes always perceives it as unfair. I don't. Like most of you, um, a lot of people don't believe that Congress people pay taxes. You would be astounded at the number of people that think we live up here rent-free. And um, uh, that uh, all of us have uh, limousine service. Uh, that's, a, that's just a common notion um, out in um, uh, the realm. And uh, no criticism of people for being misinformed. It is that they are. Now then, one of the things that really galls me is the notion that very wealthy people are great charitable givers. The statistics don't show that to be the case. In any of you that have been moving about America, Mr. Hastings, yes. is there a basketball game going on behind me? It's oh, loud. I'm sorry. We Hastings have quiet, please. We can't hear the witnesses hear your each other. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I wanted to hear you talk. Me, yeah, many of the persons um, who are very wealthy are um, sometimes fairly wealthy because they're stingy and cheap. And all of you, as I, uh, have in your constituencies Charities ranging from the United Way all the way, one that I work with uh, uh, very favorably in my community is called the Pantry. And uh, if you see the people lining up uh, that need the services and see the lack, L-A-C-K, of charitable giving, um, uh, and I don't know about where you all are from, but in Florida, where we have an awful lot of wealthy people and a few in my constituency, although I represent perhaps way, way, way more poor people than most people do, but I have a few very wealthy people. And at the very same time, charitable giving is down 15%. We need to tell the American people the God's in heaven truth. We're in a royal mess in this country. And it's just that simple. And in order to get out of royal mess, everybody has to sacrifice. 
And that's what didn't happen in the Iraqi war and in the Afghanistan war. All of us, me, you, all of us, went about our businesses, going to basketball games, going on our vacations, doing whatever it is that we do, as if nothing was happening other than the fact that we would come here and politically make the arguments when we lose a constituent or when the soldiers would come home wounded and what have you. But generally speaking in America, the same ice cream cone and everything else. Now, I'm old enough to know when the country did, did sacrifice when we were at war. And we didn't. To tell the people that. And all of us, poor and rich, need to sacrifice in order that we might be able to bring this country out of the mess that it's in. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> if I may, Madam Chair. Yes, indeed, Mr. Just thought one. Any chance that the government could sacrifice? Any chance the government Absolutely. could actually stop wasting money? Absolutely. Its belt? Absolutely. I mean, the government went on the spending spree. This Congress went on the spending spree. Our families didn't do it. Bo Our bo small businesses bo didn't do it. Both parties. And now we're coming to them. Both parties, we're right? Them. We're coming to them to, to ask them to pay for it. Yeah. I don't believe two thoughts. One, we should pay for the war. But I'm going to spend every dime necessary for our men and women to get the weapons and the technology support they need so they can win that mission and come home safely. Secondly, you're not going to spend this money for trade debt for, for reducing the deficit. You've raised, this Democrat Congress and the White House have raised taxes more than $600 billion this session. Not one dime went to reduce the debt. In fact, they doubled the spending on that. And final point, I know you didn't mean this, and I wanted to give you a chance to take it back, but when you talk about people who have our family farmers and small businesses you know, who have built up a nest egg in an in a, in a entity to send to their families. When you say that many of them haven't worked a day in their life, they're stingy and cheap, surely you're not referring to our local farmers, our local grocery stores, our local newspapers, did you hear our me, local businesses. Did you hear me say farmers and, and you said grocers? Those who have no, I did not. Did you hear me say landed gentry and the people that inherited their money that haven't worked a day in their lives? And a whole lot of them are stingy. Could you and you tell them I said so. Could you name one, Mr. Hayes? I can name several, and I won't, Let's any more one. than you can't name me any family farmers that are going to receive the brunt of this particular well, tax what, measure. I will tell you, let me give you the list of 42 organizations in America. I'm not talking about Along organizations. Street, you ask me to name in our one, farming I ask you to name one. Those who oppose the Pomeroy Amendment and support the, uh, the provisions in the bill today, I'll give you a long list of people. And they've worked hard every day in their life. Yeah, well, you, you need to come with me sometime to the breakers and hear the discussion at the Oak Bar. Mr. Hastings, would you yield for a moment? Of course. I mean, just doing the math, and I, and I would say to my friend from uh, Texas, Mr. Brady, that... Do we have five minutes so we can hear the witness? That... Um, Thank you. That in most of our congressional districts, we have about 700,000 people. Okay, based on the math, 6,600 6, out of 300 million people in this country, I would say in my district, my guess is in other districts, we're talking about maybe 15 people out of my entire congressional district would fall under or, you know, would be taxed uh, in the Pomeroy uh, versus uh, what's been proposed. And so my guess is whether you know, you're in Texas or you're in Colorado, uh, it's 15 people. And, and we're running up the debt, $23 billion for the 15 people in my district, the 15 people in your district. When we got lots of bills to pay, I mean, that's what we're talking about here. And that's why this, the amendment that's been proposed by Mr. Pomeroy really is a pretty reasonable compromise. That's why it passed the House, in my opinion, last year. And, you know, we, and I would agree with my friend, Mr. Brady, we've got a big debt that we have to tackle, and you got to start sometime. And to continue to run it up for 15 people per district, or, you know, 15 families per district, uh, I just don't think makes a lot of sense. And, and any other questions of Mr. Brady? Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chairman. Brady. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Let's ask Mr. Doggett, who is on the Ways and Means Committee. Anybody else on Ways and Means? 
No. All right, Mr. Doggett, let's hear from you. Thank you very much, uh, okay. Madam Chair and Mr. Dreyer and members of the committee. Uh, I have uh, prepared two amendments in haste. Uh, just as this bill has arrived here in haste, I don't necessarily uh, suggest that the committee adopt them as presented to the committee, but to raise concerns to you that I think are serious and far-reaching. The first concern, Social Security, and the amendment, as you see, would simply strike the payroll tax cut provisions of the bill. Uh, I believe that there is a reason for people paying Social Security payroll taxes. It's very simple. It's to get Social Security. Uh, I believe that uh, to provide a payroll tax holiday is not to provide the American people a day at the beach, but to risk the serious undermining of Social Security. The National Committee to Preserve Medicare and to Preserve Social Security and Medicare has called this provision of this deal a disaster. Uh, I think it is. We do not want to subject or treat Social Security as if it were the budget for public television or the National Park Service as important as those are. Uh, we are, are very, uh, is very rare, as this instant debate suggests, that we have a temporary tax cut in this Congress. And when we get another year or two years down the road, there will be those, and some already are, who suggest that we ought to extend this tax provision. Just as we are today. Yes. And uh, I think there's real danger to Social Security. Uh, if we begin to say that instead of it being a payroll social insurance system that people pay in and receive old age survivor and disability insurance, that what we're going to do is just borrow money from the Chinese to fund it, that it will uh, lose the sound foundation it has. This is a, an issue that has not received much attention in the course of this debate, a very serious and far-reaching question. And I would just urge the committee, it might well decide to deal with this in a different way, to give us an opportunity to vote on this matter. There is a second very serious matter. This is not the first time someone has suggested a payroll tax holiday. It was suggested by a number of Republicans as an alternative for the Economic Recovery Act. We chose not to do that. And one of the reasons we chose not to do that is doing a payroll tax holiday of this type discriminates against all of those who are not on Social Security. For example, in the state of Massachusetts, as you know, Mr. McGovern, 97% of the firefighters, the police officers, uh, I believe the public school teachers, about half of the public school teachers in the state of Texas, they're not in Social Security. Under this deal between the White House and the Republican senators, those people will not get any benefit whatsoever. About, uh, I think it's about 60 percent, Mr. Dreyer, in the state of California. Those people will get no benefit from this provision of the bill. And there's no reason why, if the Congress deems it appropriate and affordable to provide a uh, stack tax cut of this type that every American ought not to share in it. Uh, and that's why I raise this point. The second uh, point uh, it concerns uh, the, the need to provide us an opportunity to vote on whether we really do approve of the hostage taking that has occurred here with reference to the tax cuts uh, for those in the very uh, upper uh, echelons of our economy. I salute them, but I think that we ought to be focusing, uh, given the, the budget situation we have, we ought to be focusing our tax measures where they really will create jobs. I'm for less debt and more jobs. Uh, you know, the, the moment of truth commission uh, seems to have been very appropriately named because its truth only lasted for a moment. It didn't even make it for a whole week before the president and Republican senators were proposing uh, that we needed to add more or less another trillion dollars to the debt, and we worry about how to pay for it later on. It's always short-term candy and long-term castor oil. Uh, well, the two are going to come together, and I think that before we approve measures that are very wasteful uh, in terms of their ability to create job growth, uh, we ought to give an opportunity to members to vote on those provisions, and that's all this measure is really intended to do. And I would add, Mr. Dreyer, it, it also adds uh, back uh, a provision under current law concerning uh, uh, energy, uh, renewable energy jobs, and pays for it, as Mr. Herger suggested, uh, by lowering the ethanol uh, subsidy. I would prefer, as he recommends, and I applaud his amendment, to just simply eliminate it entirely. Uh, but I think it is important uh, on these provisions to, uh, to pay for what we're doing. 
Uh, and I think uh, the, the debt problem is a very serious one. I'm glad, uh, though I may not agree with all the specifics, that, that Mr. Brady uh, proposes to pay for some of them, because I think that's what ought to be done rather than just adding more and more uh, to our national debt. And I, I thank the members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. We thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of Mr. Doggett? Uh, Mr. Doggett, you, you mentioned the term hostage taking. Um, I guess the, the simple question is, can you tell me who has the majority in the House and who has the majority in the Senate? Well, I think the answer is obvious. Uh, the Senate continues to operate under the rule that the majority does not rule. Uh, it takes a supermajority there, apparently under their procedures. Uh, they can never do 60, uh, muster 60 votes in order to pass uh, a, a tax cut that I support for uh, families earning less than $250,000 or pass uh, a measure that we approved last year concerning uh, estates. Uh, Mr. Doggett, had, just uh, tell me which party has a majority in the House? The Democrats which... have the majority both places. They don't have a supermajority required by the rules of the Senate. Well, I, I'm curious about this term hostage taking being used all the time when we are in the minority and we do not control what happens in either the Senate or the House. And yet all the time when something negative is happening, it is blamed on Republicans. But I just want to make it clear that, re that the Democrats are in control of the Congress. Well, uh, if, if they're in control of the Senate, it doesn't show very well. And I assume you'd want to take credit uh, for being successful in, uh, in blocking. And uh, the ransom paid here is indeed dear. It jeopardizes Social Security. Uh, it, it does not uh, do what is necessary to address our national debt. Uh, but uh, I think the uh, senators uh, who negotiated this deal were amply rewarded and uh, much to the disadvantage of our, of our country. Well, I, I would say you and I agree that this is not a very good deal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your query. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll call a panel up. Uh, now we'll have uh, Mr. Pence, uh, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Weiner, and Mr. Welsh. Uh, uh, Mr. Graves, too, sorry. Yeah, we'll all come up. Thank you. Where do we want to sit? You can, you can. We, you and Kermit. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Welsh needs to get. Okay. Uh, all right. Why don't we, why don't we begin with Mr. Pence? How's it? Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the members of the committee. Uh, appreciate the courtesy that uh, has up to this point been shown to me in my rare appearances before the Rules Committee, and uh, grateful for the service of all the members on this panel. Would uh, like a point of personal privilege to uh, also thank uh, Mr. R. Curry for his service in the Congress uh, and the dignity with which he has performed it, uh, despite our uh, frequent political disagreements on policy. I admire you, and I wish you every success. Uh, the uh, amendment that I would offer for the uh, committee today uh, is an amendment that, in effect, would, I believe, provide certainty to American taxpayers. And I, I come before this committee understanding it's, uh, it's, it's partisan makeup, and I understand the traditions of this committee. But I, I come before the committee in a spirit of um, recognizing that there uh, is change in the air three weeks from today. Uh, Congress will change by virtue of the will of the American people in its majority. And I would uh, respectfully request members of this committee uh, to maybe think about breaking training a little bit on uh, this rule and considering allowing the minority an opportunity to vote on what I believe uh, every House Republican would like to have a chance to vote on in this debate. Uh, and that is to uh, 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 permanently extend all the current tax rates established in 2001 and 2003. My amendment would permanently repeal uh, the uh, death tax. It would also prevent a tax increase on capital gains and dividends, and it would provide uh, permanent relief uh, for the alternative minimum tax by increasing the AMT exemption. Uh, let me say uh, 
uh, a week or so back, uh, the, the majority had the opportunity to vote on its preference, uh, which included uh, uh, what would amount to a tax increase in January on Americans above a certain income level. And, uh, uh, and I know there's this deal that I am not enamored of and have announced my opposition to. But I think we have an opportunity here to let the House work its will. And uh, I, want to, I want to encourage the members of this committee to consider that in the waning days of this Congress. Um, not, not simply because I, I believe that extending all the current tax rates would establish certainty. I was at Muncie, Indiana yesterday. Had a banker uh, come up to me and, and uh, ask me about the tax deal. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, not too many people are going to come into my bank and sign a five-year note on a two-year tax code. Uh, the truth is, if we, uh, our, our, our primary obligation here ought to be to do that, which is truly going to be effective in putting Americans back to work and, and keeping the current tax rates on the books and just saying that those are the tax laws. We may have debates in the future about tax reform, tax relief. Majorities change. We, they, you, you all may be back in power someday talking about raising taxes in this chamber. But for now, let's just say to the American people, these are the rules of the road. For the long term. And, and I must say, uh, to be candid, one of the things that's frustrated me about the public debate is, and, and I don't blame anybody for this, it's not been a misrepresentation, but it, people talking about tax cuts. Nobody's talking about tax cuts. We're just talking about are we going to keep the tax rates, what they are now, or are we going to let them go up? And uh, I, I think we all know that. And, and I just believe that uncertainty is the enemy of prosperity. And, and to, 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 create a, a certainty, a threshold that says, all right, now businesses can begin to make decisions and begin to make some long-term investments, um, I think would be the best chance we have at putting Americans back to work in the next two years. I, I got I to tell you, uh, I really don't believe that we will see a significant change in the uh, employment picture in this country with a two-year extension of tax rates. I just really don't believe it. Now, it, it disgusts me that some people on both sides of the political debate, commentators out there, talk about the political advantages of the economy staying bad. That disgusts me. What we ought to do, every single one of us here, is say, what would really work based on the building blocks of American prosperity to really get this economy moving again? And in my judgment, the first is let the concrete dry. Just say, that's what the tax code is. Now, you all start. It's a tough time out there. Families are hurting. And let's uh, continue it. And my, my petition today is, is to ask for an up or down vote on the House floor to do that as an amendment. Last thought, if I may. And I think I've got some colleagues here with whom I never agree, as near as I can tell. A couple of them. Yeah, we but we found, office. we found, <laughs> I, uh, on post offices, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll give you that. Yeah. But there is this business, I think there's some agreement at this diverse table. And that is, in, in Article I, Section 7 of the Constitution, which I, I, am, I am hesitant to recite to the distinguished members of this panel, know the Constitution as well as anyone in this body. Article I, Section 7 says, if I may quote it, all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. Not some bills. Not if bills are done in negotiations down the street, if bills are done with members of the minority in the Senate and the White House, if, if time is of the essence, says all bills originate here. And I believe the reason for that is because our founders understood that as pertains matters of the people's taxes, that the people's house should always lead. Wherever that takes us, whatever those policies are. And I think this is a moment where where a broad rule should be written that says, let the House work its will. People have said to me, well, what if, what if you got an up or down vote? Uh, my, my, my colleague, Senator Jim DeMinn, offered this amendment in the Senate, and it was unsuccessful. People said to me, well, what if you got an up or down vote to make all the tax rates permanent? I said, I don't know. I, I, I'd, like, I'd like a good faith opportunity to go down, make the case, count the vote. I have, I have the same attitude about my colleagues who have a different perspective on how this thing ought to shake out. But the idea that, uh, that and I understand they're using a bill that passed out of the House and they're hollowing it out, but the, the spirit and the letter of Article I, Section 7 says that those of us most accountable and closest to the people ought to lead on matters of, of revenue. And I think that's a principle that we ought to preserve. 
And so I, I urge uh, 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 the committee to uh, 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 consider uh, uh, this amendment, consider ruling it in order, and, and, uh, and let, let the House work its will with a broad amendment. Let's, let's, let's go for a couple of days on this thing, and let's preserve the principle that the People's House governs in matters pertaining to the revenues of the American people. Thank you very much. Mr. Welsh. I'll defer to Mr. All right. Wiener. Mr. Wiener first. Well, well uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Mr. Welsh and I are operating in, uh, in concert to offer an amendment. I, 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 I can't help but be puzzled how my good friend Mr. Mr. Pence can make this presentation without pointing out once why it is that these right. tax cuts are expiring, as if the expiration ferry landed in Congress this year and said tax bills expire. They expired because 10 years ago, as a stunt, as a, as, a, as a tactic to avoid true accountability, our Republican friends passed an unaffordable tax cut that was unpaid for and then said in order to make it appear as if it doesn't have long-term budget impact, we're going to have it uh, uh, lapse at this point. That insecurity, that uncertainty, that lack of assuredness was written into the bill. And perhaps it was a blessing because it gives us the opportunity here to say, what is the best policy for the United States of America today, and what's the best policy for our kids? One thing is for sure, Mr. Chairman. It is inconsistent to say you support tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires, and then say you're concerned about the deficit. You just can't do it. It, it is, I mean, I'm sure someone will figure out a way to do it, but the bottom line is this is a question about whether we are going to give tax cuts to billionaires and borrow from our kids to give it. That's the bottom line. Now, we can say, oh, that's good for the economy today to borrow for Rupert Murdoch's tax cut from our kids, 40 percent of it from, from our kids. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's something that, that is a good campaign slogan. Maybe that works. But that's exactly what we're doing. And so what Mr. Welsh and I are here to do is say, listen, you can make an argument that tax cuts have a stimulative effect, although economists say almost to a person that actually direct investment is the most stimulative thing. There, you know, Zandi, who's this guy that everyone quotes around here as if he's, you know, one of the faces on the Capitol, you know, he says that it's about twice as stimulative money that is invested directly. So if you really want to invest, that's the way to do it. But what we say is, look, for those people, 250,000, and I'm prepared with unanimous consent to people don't like that number, make it a million. Say that anyone over a million dollars, someone making a billion dollars, you know, doesn't necessarily need a tax cut right now. There's no evidence it's that stimulative. And also the idea that they deserve it or they've earned it. I don't begrudge them because they're well-to-do, Mr. McGovern. I think that one of the reasons that they're extraordinarily well-to-do and the top 1% of this country earns the same amount as the next 27% is in large part we gave them a very large tax cut. And I want to remind all of us, what we're talking about here is going back to the tax rates for those people that were in play under, under Bill Clinton that were, by any economic measure, a success. And by the way, we're also talking about going back in another part of the bill, going back to the estate taxes that were the same level of, wait for it, Ronald Reagan. Okay? We are not talking about these gigantic transformative things. Now, it is true that in January of this year, and, 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 and Mr. Brady, who testified earlier, danced around this point. He was conflating a couple of things. If the, ta if the estate tax lapses completely, it goes down to the one million level. And just to make a point that you made, Mr. McGovern, that means the first million dollar that comes to you comes in without any taxes. And in answer to what Ms. Fox was saying, I want to make sure everyone understands, every single dollar that comes to us gets taxed before it gets to us. When our employer gets it, he gets taxed. When, he, when, when you buy a loaf of bread, the, lo the loaf of bread manufacturer got taxed. This mythology, oh, it's immoral to tax something twice. No. The person who's dead isn't being taxed anymore. May he, rest, he or she rest in peace. The only question is, is what do we believe as a country? Do we believe that people who inherit money should be taxed on that, rate, on that money less on a lower rate than someone who works 70 hours that week on a construction site? Is that who we are morally as a country? Is that what we believe, that that money is so much more valuable that we should tax it at a lower rate? And let's remember one other thing about the estate tax. A lot of the estate tax inheritance is unrealized gains. So nobody ever pays taxes on the increased value of those assets, which is 90% of what gets passed along. This idea, it's a corner bodega, that someone worked his sleeves rolled up his entire life. No, there are none of those. And I mean none of those. The reason Mr. Brady didn't have any is because there aren't any. We're talking a few hundred people, most of them millionaires and billionaires. 
So the Wiener Welch Amendment does a couple of things. One, it takes the tax break for those over $250,000, puts half of it towards retiring the debt and does with the other half of it, let's invest in some infrastructure, $70 billion worth. It winds up saving us a good deal of money. This whole bill, this whole amendment, by the way, saves us about $60 billion. Secondly, it would take the estate tax level not down to where it would lapse to anyway, but go to the Pomeroy level. The next thing it would do, it would take some of the money that we have that, that we, and give a $250 COLA for Social Security beneficiaries. That's very stimulative. It's people on fixed incomes. They should get it. Next thing it would do is it would say, we're going to take away this idea of a payroll tax holiday, which funds the payroll tax from the Social Security Trust Fund, something that, by the way, overwhelmingly the American people understand and don't like. If you look to the poll that came out yesterday, they may like the overall package. This is one that's offensive to them. And replace it with the making work pay. Uh, the making, uh, making work pay. This has a couple of advantages. One, it, it's much more direct, less bureaucracy. Secondly, employees that don't have Social Security taken out, and there are a lot of people, state workers and the other, uh, w wouldn't lose them. Let me just conclude with this point, and then you know, I want to let the rest of my colleagues speak. You know, a lot of the controversy and debate the last week or so about this deal has been about, you know, was it a good deal? Was it a bad deal? Who's up? Who's down? Who's got the leverage? Who doesn't? The bottom line that we should be thinking about here is what's fundamentally fair? Have we lost sight of the fact that it is simply fundamentally not fair to say to a millionaire, here's a $126,000 tax cut when you have people out there who are struggling each and every day, paycheck to paycheck to make things go? And it is fundamentally unfair to give that tax cut by borrowing money for it. That's the moral issue that we're dealing with here. This version of the bill still gives the tax cuts to all the middle class and those struggling to make it. It still stimulates the economy, I think, even more by having some transportation funding. Fix the estate tax at a very high level. Still, it's going to be very few people who are going to wind up paying it. And it also takes the making work, work, uh, uh, work pay credit and substitutes it for the payroll tax holiday and also the Social Security COLA. It's fair. It's well-rounded. It it's, it's cheaper than the bill that's going to be on the floor. And I think overall, it is something um, uh, that, that we should embrace. Thank you. Just well. Uh, just a couple of points. I want to pick up where uh, Congressman Pence uh, uh, made a statement that is really, I think, quite relevant. The constitutional provision that he cited is about revenue measures originating in the House. And whether technically what happened in the Senate is in compliance is one thing, but whether the spirit of it is quite another. And it suggests to me that this Rules Committee, empowered as it is with deciding what amendments will be made in order, should consider a liberal approach on this so that the House has the opportunity to express its will on revenue measures. That's the main thing. The second point, just adding to what Congressman Weiner said, is, is this. The justification for this bill has been that it's stimulus and fairness. We should have a bill that is focused on job creation and not on excess debt. We should have a bill that has the most strict focus on more jobs and less debt than we can. And all tax cuts are not the same. And Anthony Weiner just outlined the weight of opinion about economists. This amendment would allow us to essentially accomplish the stimulative goals of the president, but at less expense to the taxpayer. So we ask that it be made in order. Thank you very much, Ms. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Briefly talk about my amendment. My amendment is really more than an amendment. It's a substitute to the proposal and taking different uh, ideas from both sides. There's a lot of passion on both sides, from the conservative side to the liberal side on, on where we're going to go with this measure. So my, my substitute does a few things. And one, it makes the tax cuts permanent, the 2001-2003, and uh, extends the unemployment insurance uh, eligibility, just like the President was asking for, repeals the estate tax and uh, extends the uh, AMT patch. It extends the bonus depreciation, just as the President was asking. But it does, does this uh, by paying for all those things, by rescinding the unused stimulus funds and then moving back to 2008 funding level for the continuing resolution and then banning all earmarks. And, and I share all that because I've heard the debate, and there's a lot of, a lot of great um, debate on each side. And I, and I hear their arguments and they're passionate about what they believe, while I philosophically may disagree with it. I believe that they have the opportunity, and they should have the opportunity to voice their opinion on the floor. And uh, Mr. Pence made such a compelling argument that, you know, basically what he was outlining is that each of us were sent here 
uh, from our districts to be the voice for our district. And as we've heard over the last several days, at least from the Senate, and that is if any changes are made, then the deal is off. But that really just silenced the voices of millions of Americans all across this great country. And the 800,000 or so uh, people that I represent in North Georgia sent me here to be their voice, to, to be able to offer amendments such as this, to have the chance to debate that and, and to defend my side of the argument as well as listen to the other sides of the argument as we have here today. So uh, I, I implore you today to just really consider all these amendments, whether we agree philosophically or not. Allow each of us to make our case on the floor to, uh, to really to, to sell the package that we may have or the simple amendments that we may have and to be that voice for the districts that we represent. So uh, I lay before you an amendment that's a substitute that just sort of brings together issues from both sides and tries to find that common ground that I think we're all looking for. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all being here. Let me just ask a question. How much would it cost to extend the Bush tax cuts, all of them permanently? Well, I've, I've seen the estimates, the public estimates, and I'm, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not in a position to offer a score on a permanent extension. But I, I want to I tell you, Mr. McGovern, that I'm, I understand the static analysis approach that congressional budget experts use. And it would come as no surprise to you that I question it. I really do. I, I really believe that history teaches that, that, um, a, a, uh, that, that lower marginal tax rates, particularly with regard to Americans that have the ability to invest capital into the economy, results in not only growth in the economy, but growth in government revenues. And that, that's, that has historically been almost always not predicted by the predictors here in Washington, D.C. So I, I know that I, I know the the 10 year estimates on expanding the, the tax relief and the permanent estimates. I'm just I'm falling back on on my belief that it, that when when President Kennedy lowered marginal rates, when Ronald Reagan lowered marginal rates, uh, when we did them, uh, despite Mr. Weiner's assertion, when when uh, when we did them, they after the towers fell there they have had the attendant effect of, of generating economic growth. But the certainty of that and creating those rates as the as a floor for the American people to build on is key. No, and I, I appreciate that. But when, when President Bush, these great tax cuts that we're all talking about here, that they don't seem to have created very many jobs. And when Bill Clinton left office, we actually had a surplus. Um, and then all of a sudden, we went into deficit spending. And I think economists, conservative and liberal, and everybody in between, I think all agree that one of the major reasons for that deficit you know, were these unpaid for tax cuts, uh, as well as an unpaid for war. And I don't know whether or not Mr. Brady's going to, is pledging that, that, you, that the Republicans are going to pay for the wars, you know, and offset, offset them. But I mean, the reality is that uh, they did contribute to the deficit and they weren't paid for. And I think you know, one of the things that we tried to talk about, uh, you know, with this pay go that uh, provision we had is that it, from, not, it, from now on you pay as you go. If you want to add another dollar to the Department of Education, you got to find an offset. You cut someplace or you raise revenue. If you want to, you know, extend tax cuts to millionaires or billionaires, fine, but find a way to pay for them. And I, you know, I, I'll look at Mr. Graves. I, I'm not sure eliminating um, earmarks is going to uh, cover the cost because what's going to happen is that that the money that those of us in Congress, you know, our, our people sent us here to fight for projects back home. We're, we're now saying we'll leave them to bureaucrats and agencies who know nothing about my state or your state. The money will be there. They will do the earmarking. You know, we won't. So I, I, that's, that's just that's my concern. Dr. Fox, do you have any questions or comments or insights? Um, well, I, I want to uh, point out again that um, Many of you talk about tax cuts, that we are giving tax cuts to the rich. Um, we have tax rates which you want to raise. <laughs> and I just think it's very important that we clear up the language here. I think Mr. Pence uh, did that. And I always, that's not what this is about. This is not about giving tax cuts. It's about stopping tax increases from occurring for every single American well, you, in the country. Will you yield for one, one second? Certainly. Yeah. I, I don't think it's about this debate's about that at all. I think it's about what Mr. Weiner said. This is about fairness. 
uh, and about uh, you know what's fair. Uh, and I will say to you that um, I think middle class families in this country, you know, have, have unfortunately uh, been forced to to carry the burden, you know, of this economic catastrophe that we're in right now. And um, I don't think it's fair to ask them to dig, dig us out of this mess. Mm -hmm. I think we all, have, we, we all have a responsibility. It's about fairness. And multimillionaires, you know, you, okay. you know, ought to be able to pay their fair share. That's all. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with you. I wrote down the comment that Mr. Weiner said, what is fundamentally fair? You know, what makes this country a great country is that fortunately, um, we, we have allowed the capitalistic system to operate. We have allowed people to have equal opportunity. We don't guarantee equal results. We offer equal opportunity. And it's not up to us to sit here and decide what is fundamentally fair. We leave it to our culture to do that. All the cultures in the world that have failed are the ones that have decided that they want to achieve equality among the people and that the government should decide what is fundamentally fair. What separates this country from every other country in the world is the fact that we allow people unlimited opportunity to make as much money as they want to make and they're as free as they are in Absolutely. any place in the world. No disagreement. And once- but what, what, what building is our culture in? Once the government begins deciding what is fundamentally fair, you stop being the freest country in the world and you stop allowing people to have unlimited opportunity. And I, I just think that, that our is not our decision. We, we would have great differences on what's fundamentally fair. To me, what's fundamentally fair is to allow everybody to have unfettered opportunity. Do you believe in no taxation? Oh, I believe in taxation. Well, I you think, think you're making judgments about, you know. Well, let me, what, let me say yeah. one other thing. I think Mr. Uh, Hastings said people perceive that they pay too much. Well, you know, I read an extraordinarily excellent study that was done several years ago. It's now been several years where it said they, they did a survey in this country, probably one of the best that's ever been done. They surveyed every income level every category you could possibly think of, and they came up with basically the same information. People believe paying about 25% of what they earn is a fair tax rate. And that, I mean, it's just, it was a superb study. Again, I, I, that's my field, and I, I read the study, looked at it very carefully. So there, it isn't true that people perceive they pay too much in all cases, but people do understand when the government has overreached. And people pretty cheerily pay up to about 25% of their income in this country. And what, you're, what, what, what happened in the bill before was we actually lowered taxes for the lower income people. We went from 15 down to 10%. If, if the tax increases aren't stopped, the people who are currently paying 10% go up to 15%. So I think what passed 10 years ago was a pretty good bill. And it wasn't, Mr. Weiner, because there were tricks being played, but it was because, as somebody else pointed out, it took 60 votes to do a reconciliation bill in the Senate. And Democrats wouldn't go along with that reconciliation to give permanent tax cuts. That was the problem. So I, I think you all, again, are, are subject to your opinions, but I don't think it's right to allow you to rewrite history. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wiener, well, I, I just want to quickly respond. The fact that the rates, the rates are going like this, up and then down and then up back again, the change is happening is because the Republicans voted for it to be this way. You could have added an 11th year 
You could have added a 12th year. You could have added a 30th year. You could have done that. The rates are going to where they are because of this maneuver, and it's, there's a little bit of irony, and I'm sure you observed it as you were saying it, for blaming the senatorial rules and reconciliation for the, for the problem that created this imperfect bill. I'm sure you see the irony of saying that when it's the same exact thing that you bludgeon us about the face of the years for not being able to do the things we'd like, like, for example, write this bill in the, in the House the way we would like to. And let me, let me just, just say one thing. You know, Ms. McFox raise, raises a, a good point, and it's something that we should think about, and maybe Mr. Pence and his presidential campaign can observe this. You know, one of the things that we may want to do is just say, handle inherited wealth just like any other income. Like, why does it have this special status? It's money you're getting. It's like gambling wages. You're not really working for it. Why not have to deal with it? Any, any other income? There's an op-ed in today's New York Times that suggested that. Rather than have a separate tax, tax for it with a certain amount that is tax-free, deal with it like income, and I think you'll have very little, very little disagreement. You decide what the rate should be. You decide what the proper income rate should be. That's the thing. You know, Teddy Roosevelt, that great Republican, was the one who, who spoke most eloquently about why the estate tax exists in this country. It is because it is not a based on how hard you work. It's not. It's not based on, on, on whether you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's whether or not you're very, very lucky to be, to have been in a good gene pool. That's the question about the estate tax. It is actually un-American to say, oh, the, the, most, the most successful people will be the ones that are going to inherit money. I think the most successful people in this country should be the ones that work hard, that build companies, that make, them, that make their, their lives if, if follow the American dream. Someone who sits back and has the great good fortune to simply have a relative that dies who's very wealthy, Exactly what American ideal did they live up to? What exactly did they do? What makes them any more virtuous than the guy in my district who's working on a construction site all day rebuilding the, uh, ground zero? Why is that person any less virtuous? So I, I think that actually you, you, you and I agree on the fundamental values of this country, but I think we should certainly agree that inherited wealth doesn't make you some kind of great American. It just means you got very, very lucky. Mr. Pence, did you announce yet? <laughs> I, I, might have, I might have just harmed his chances. <laughs> I think he endorsed you. I thought Mayor Wiener yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you can see the first hit ad on Pence. You know, <laughs> Pence advisor Anthony Wiener says. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I actually think this. I, I think we've come across a very important uh, debate here. And I, and I respect Mr. Wiener's uh, philosophy of government. I respect the chairman's philosophy of government. In the, in, in the sense of my friends on the left, that the fundamental the question is what is fundamentally fair. I I, I would offer, uh, as uh, as Dr. Fox uh, suggested, that our philosophy of government says that, that that the question is what is fundamentally effective. And I I suspect there is no one in this institution who would be interested in creating a tax code that met some um, objective standard of fairness and drove us to 30 percent unemployment. I mean, the reality is that we have had an unemployment over 9.4 percent for the past 19 months. This is the longest stretch since the Great Depression. And we simply have to look at, historically, how have we been able to lay the building blocks on which the American people were able to get back on their feet? And, and I know that estate taxes, we prefer to call them death taxes, uh, are, are a, a popular target in the public debate. But, you know, where I live in Indiana, it's about small business owners, family farmers. It's about, it's about paying insurance premiums to pay for the life insurance. That's out of their cash flow every quarter. And it significantly affects their ability to hire people, their ability to expand their business. And at a time of persistent unemployment, what, what I would suggest is that we ought, to, we ought to make all the tax rates permanent. We ought to permanently repeal death taxes, get this economy back on its feet again, and then we can get back to arguing full time about whether we're, whether we're to pursue policies of growth that are uh, uh, the goal of which is that they are effective or those that are fair. But, but not, not here and not now should we be caught in, in an ideological struggle. We ought to be saying what has worked in the past, and let's pursue that in the future. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Perlmutter. Yeah, just a couple points in, in, in response to Mr. Pence and also uh, some things that Mr. Weiner was saying. First of all, and, and to Mr. Grace, too, I mean, we keep talking about permanent this, permanent that. I mean, obviously, any Congress can change the law 
any time. And so whether you call it a permanent tax cut or permanent tax increase, the next Congress can always change that. And the Congress 10 years ago in its wisdom said, okay, we're going to set it this way, we're going to keep them down for a while. Maybe it was because of the uh, attacks on the trade towers or it was just planned, but the whole plan was revenue would go up. And unlike the um, provision in the Constitution, Article 1, Article 1, Section 0.7, all bills raising revenue, this reduces revenue. Reduces revenue, $900 billion for the highest earners, you know, those who earn more than 250. There's a tax cut for everybody up to 250 and then some. That's $900 billion where we drop our revenue. We have bills to pay. This country pays its bills, and we got to start thinking about that. With respect to the middle income earners, it's, it's trillion at least dollars in revenue drop. So, you know, over a course of years. And so we, the real question, and I, and I agree with Mr. Pence, I mean, there is a serious issue here of do we need to uh, not follow along with what the Republican Congress set 10 years ago so that revenue would increase so that we could pay our bills because the economy is too fragile. And apparently that's what the Republicans in the Senate thought and the President thought that the economy is too fragile. So we're not going to increase revenue even though we got bills to pay. And that's a real debate. That's a tough nut. But on the estate tax, I don't think there's any issue here. Like I was saying to Mr. Uh, Brady, in, in my congressional district, 700,000 people, you know, suburbs of Denver, it's maybe 15 people, but there are 15 people who've passed away. They're not here. This is dead millionaires and dead billionaires that we're talking about. And Mr. Crowley, and I, you know, I mean, I'd ask my friend Mr. Weiner if he knows who this lady is. You know who the lady is? Yes, I do, sir. And, and uh, I would say, for the record, Mr. Chairman, this is Leona Helmsley before she passed away. And that's her dog, Trouble, who inherited some $12 million. And Trouble would be affected by this bill, by the, uh, would be affected by the amendment that Mr. Pomeroy suggested. He's hired Cassidy and so So yeah. we've got bills to pay, but apparently Trouble doesn't want to be part of paying those bills. We've got a lot of work to do in this country. I think that we have a very big issue in front of us. And there is a real philosophical debate, but there are points where it goes beyond the debate, and it's pretty clear. And so for me, going back to the Pomeroy issue, the inheritance tax, trouble, who I just was pointing at, you know, wouldn't have to pay on the first three and a half million dollars that Trouble, and I don't know whether Trouble's a boy or a girl, but wh whatever uh, gender Trouble is, and then would have to pay some tax on the balance. So we've got, um, I think the amendment that was proposed by, uh, uh, by Mr. Pomeroy is perfectly in order. I think that we've got to remember this really is about reducing revenues to the United States and its effect on its ability to pay for bills, whether it's national security interests, you know, ta uh, the wars in the Middle East, in Iraq and Afghanistan, or whether it's to assist people who are unemployed because the economy took such a dive when Wall Street crashed. So this is a, this is a very difficult <coughs> bill for all of us because we have to really tackle this question of paying bills versus trying to keep a fragile economy going. And, I, and that's where it comes down. I think the estate tax, for me, that's a no-brainer. It should be at $3.5 million per person, $7 million per couple, not 10. I think the Republican senators squeezed the very last bit they could get out of this deal, and it's, and it's a bridge too far. They, they really uh, squeezed this one to a point that a lot of us uh, really say too much. And uh, I think trouble should have to pay some tax. Thank you. On that money that she inherited. Anywhere else, Mr. Curie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to this panel. This is one of the, uh, um, I think, more intellectual stimulating debates that we have had here, uh, exploring, I think, an issue that um, uh, certainly we could probably talk about for the rest of the night. But I want to say um, 
Uh, Mr. Weiner, I, I, I commend you on the points that you made, um, uh, especially regarding you know Theodore Roosevelt. I, I listen, and, and I we have to think about I think conceptually this idea of, and again, I, I mentioned it earlier before this panel was up about this idea here in America about promoting uh, meritocracy, about people according to their merit. And we didn't develop this idea. I mean, I hear my friends on the other side of the aisle talk about this as if this is strictly an American idea. I mean, any first year law student knows, has struggled with this idea of the rule against perpetuities. That was Great Britain's idea of making sure that land didn't stay invested in the gentry, that it was passed on, that it couldn't be tied up. It was the same concept that we that we work on here, the same idea. Why should a person, uh, uh, again, Mr. Weiner, to your point, um, uh, be further ahead than someone else simply because they inherited a great deal of money? And you know, I, I listen, uh, um, Mr. Pence, your idea of fundamental uh, effect, I think is uh, effective, I think is what you said. And I, I think that's a very, f I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what that term means, but it, it sounds like it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating term in terms of how can we be most effective in terms of how we do it? But we have to think about fairness. I mean, let's look at the, the highway trust fund. So we fund it by putting a straight tax on everyone who drives. It is clearly probably one of the least fair tax that we impose because uh, an, a, a businessman probably writes it off, his, his gas, um, whereas someone who is working probably pays it. So you know, if we were to use the estate tax to put into the highway trust fund, that would be a wonderful way to fund our infrastructure, building our infrastructure. It would be an effective way of doing it. And, and I'm not sure uh, of, of what you mean by that concept, but I think we have to think about this in terms of fairness and in terms of uh, uh, continuing uh, uh, the, the meritocracy that we have here in America. And would, with, would the gentleman yield? I would be happy I mean, to yield another, an, uh, Suggested to me uh, by one of my neighbors uh, back in, in Golden, Colorado was that the estate tax revenues be used to go straight to pay in the debt. And, you know, that uh, whoever it is that's passed away has benefited by the country, by our ability to def defend ourselves, by our transportation and education systems, and this debt has been increasing over time. Nobody, uh, you know, debates that. But maybe that's another way that we ought to think about it, whether it's in this bill or some other point, of using those funds, whether it's transportation trust fund or paying down the debt. And with that, I yield back to my well, friend. As a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, I like the idea of it going into the Highway Trust Fund better. But with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. Anybody else? Let me, let me thank this panel. Let me, if I could just say one last thing, you know, because I think it's important to note, you know, we're, we're having this debate about, uh, you know, Tax, uh, tax relief, but there are a lot of people in this country uh, whom this debate really doesn't matter because they, are, they have fallen through the cracks. And I have a lot of people in my district, you know, um, you know who are not, who, and, 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 and people who are working, you know, who can't afford to put food on the table for their kids. And, you know, and I, and I, and I'm, I'm, I worry, you know, as we approach the new Congress, and I congratulate my Republican friends for their victory, but I really do worry that, uh, when we, that, that the budget will be, will be balanced on the backs of some of the most vulnerable in this country. We have a hunger problem in this country. Uh, we have kids who go to bed who don't have enough to who don't eat in this country. We should be ashamed of that fact. Uh, and, um, you know, and quite frankly, the stuff that we're talking about here is not going to impact them uh, and it's not going to impact them immediately where they need help immediately. So as, as we approach the the, the, the new Congress, and we talk about ways to balance the budget and reduce the deficit. I mean, I, I hope that we will keep in mind that uh, that government does provide a safety net for people, and if that safety net didn't exist, I mean, I mean, people literally would perish. And right now, I'll tell you, that safety net has a lot of holes in it. And I see it not only in Massachusetts; I've seen it all around the country. Uh, and so uh, I yield to the gentleman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, say that we've had a lengthy hearing. We <clears throat> began, and I shared my comments uh, with the, uh, the opening panel, and I haven't injected myself here. But I will say that uh, there's often an attempt made to <clears throat> characterize Republicans as uh, some way being less than concerned about the underclass, those who are struggling to get onto the first rung of the economic ladder. And it's very clear that with our proposals, we are doing everything that we possibly can to ensure opportunity for every American. And um, 
a famous line that was attributed to Abraham Lincoln that he never said was wonderful to be a guy who said all kinds of great things and have even things he didn't say that are great attributed to you. But Abraham Lincoln didn't say, but is credited with having said, you can't lift up the wage earner by pulling down the wage payer. And the notion that we are all in this together and that we want to create opportunity for all is something that we feel very passionately about. We recognize the need for a safety net. And the old line that Jack Kemp used to put out there is, is that should be a safety net and not a hammock. We want to ensure that we don't encourage the cycle of dependence. I got a call last night from a constituent who runs an employment agency who was pleading with me not to extend unemployment benefits under any circumstance whatsoever. And this is a small businesswoman who's struggling to make ends meet. She is seeing the problems that exist with the dramatic extension. Now, we have said that we want to ensure that even though there are some people who are at this juncture receiving benefits and are not looking for work, we don't want anyone who is out there day in and day out struggling to find a job opportunity to go hungry. And so that's the reason that we have said that we'd like to have it paid for, but we support the notion of uh, ensuring that people who are hurting, and we know that there are people hurting, and we all acknowledge that, have their needs, needs met. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me say that um, I recognize, I, I, I'd like to inquire of you when we're going to have hearings. I will say that one of the things of which I'm most proud that will happen with the new majority is that we will have television coverage of the Rules Committee. And uh, I, I, I would say that, I would say that uh, today's meeting is <laughs> sort of an, an introduction to the fact that we will have a wonderful opportunity to regularly have full television coverage. This meeting has gone on for approaching two to two and a half hours now, and I look forward to our meetings in the 112th Congress. I, I would inquire of you, sure I would inquire of you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. But yeah. I would inquire of you, uh, Mr. Chairman, what, what, what we can anticipate as far as a, a markup schedule for the rule that as you know, under martial law rule, we could move immediately to the House floor, although the rumor is that we might be proceeding till tomorrow. Yeah, I think we will be, uh, this will be on the floor so tomorrow. So we don't need martial law rule we, for we'll this be, we'll be on the We'll be on the floor tomorrow, but we're, we'll, we're gonna, we're gonna, when I'm finished, we're going to recess subject to the call of the chair, which I hope won't be that long. Let me, ju let me just say one thing, uh, Mr. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think that uh, my comments about uh, those who are struggling in this country, uh, I, you know, I, I'll say in a bipartisan way. I mean, I think Thank you. I think I think I, appreciate I, think, I think it is, uh, for whatever reason, become unfashionable in this country to, to worry about the poorest of the poor, and I and I'm really worried about that. And and I'm not talking about a, a, a creating a, a, a culture of dependency. A lot of the poor work for a living, and they can't afford to put food on the table. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I co-chair the Hunger Caucus, as you know, and so I this issue is, I, I feel very passionately about this issue because I. If anybody here has ever seen a hungry, hungry child, you're, it breaks your heart. And in this country, of all places, I mean, the richest country on the planet, it shouldn't be. And so, you know, I, I, I just say that to kind of put all this in perspective, because a lot of what we're talking about here today doesn't at all provide the help and the immediate help that a lot of these people need. So having said that, I appreciate very much the panel. and. Uh, uh, the Rules Chairman. Committee stands adjourned, subject to the call of the Thank chair. You. Thank you. And the full House will take up the tax cut bill with three hours of debate and consideration of an amendment to the estate tax provision in the Senate passed bill. Live coverage of today's House session begins at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Hi, I'm Pam Gorey, Education Program Specialist here at C-SPAN Classroom. Each year we conduct our video documentary competition called Student Cam. The competition asks students in grades 6 through 12 to think critically about issues affecting our nation. This year